Welcome to the Twist News. I'm Erica Gray. Today, I'm pleased to have on the show Ralph Bunton. He is the Senior Vice President of the World Israel Union. Ralph is also an author and writer, and his many articles and essays have appeared in the Times of Israel, the Jerusalem Post, the United Israel Bulletin, the Southern Shofar, and he is the author of the Book of David, David Horowitz. And David Horowitz was the Dean of the United Nations Press Corps and founder of the United Israel World Union. Well, Ralph, it's wonderful to have you. Welcome to the, welcome to the twist again. Well, thank you, Erica. It's good to be back. And uh, I really appreciate uh, so much uh, your invitation to participate. You have a great series on the Times of Israel, and I wanted to talk about that because you're talking about the history of Palestine, and there's a lot of misconceptions out there about Palestine. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, as we all know, and as the world knows, on October 7th, uh, the Islamist terror group Hamas attacked Israel, and more than a thousand people were viciously murdered many of them women and children, and the resulting consequences has led to an armed conflict in the Middle East and a dramatic wave of anti-Semitism worldwide. So, I set about to begin a new series that I call In Defense of Israel. It was an attempt to bring a historical perspective that would offer Erica a better a more accurate understanding of the present day conflict uh, and the challenge, I find that there's, there's no lack of education, or really, there's no lack of ignorance out there uh, when it comes to an understanding of Judaism and uh, an understanding of, of uh, Jewish history uh, for the past 4,000 years. So I, I thought perhaps that I could bring in some facts from the past and add a little history that would, uh, would give a more, a more historical perspective. You know, there's, there's actually no cutoff point to indicate when history stops and current affairs begin. The present emerges from the past, and we need a knowledge of the past to be, to be able to understand the present uh, in its proper perspective. So, I thought about to write a series and bring in some history on the development of how it all came about to give a better understanding of both sides uh, in our present day conflict. What do you feel is the biggest misconceptions, the biggest misinformation concerning the Palestinian Israel conflict? Well, again, I think it's the lack of a proper understanding of history. Uh, history did not begin in 1948. Uh, as it's well been said, we have, um, you're right, we have, uh, we have demonstrations uh, worldwide uh, with people marching in the street, chanting from the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free. And it, as it was well put, uh, these are, many of these people uh, can't name or live the big river or point to the sea or the map. And it, it's important to bring in some history that, that happened prior to 1948. Uh, Hamas and the Palestinians uh, continue to see Israel as an occupying nation with no right to be there and no right to exist. And they seek to destroy the only democracy that we have in the Middle East, uh, the only democracy that, uh, that allow the stand for women, women's rights, for gay rights, uh, for a, a free, independent, and elected uh, Knesset, and a nation that has contributed so much uh, with over with as little as 2% of the world population, they've given us 22% of the Nobel Prize winners uh, in important areas such as literature and medical and education. And uh, I, I would that 
people would have a better understanding of the totality of the Jewish experience. Something you said, and you and I have talked about it, the Palestinian state, the two-state solution. How come world leaders are embracing this when it is known, you know it, uh, a lot of Israelites know it, that as you said, they don't even acknowledge that Israel has a right to exist. And their, their whole point of occupation is that Israel is completely on their land. I mean, why are the world leaders not getting the memo on this? That if there was to be a two-state, it would definitely jeopardize the state of Israel. Well, I believe strongly, Erica, that that uh, part of the strong backlash has to do with the age-old problem of anti-Semitism. Uh, I believe that Abraham Foxman the, uh, of the Anti-Defamation League, uh, he's retired now, but he led uh, that organization for over 25 years, probably put it best when he said anti-Semitism is a disease. It's a disease without an antidote and without a, a vaccine. And it cannot be completely eliminated. Now, the Jewish community, as Foxman has indicated, uh, can eliminate it, and it's developed a containment strategy. If you can't eliminate it, it at least can contain it and try to keep the lid on the sewer. Now, I'd like to just ask you one quick question about yourself, Ralph. You're a Gentile. I'm a Gentile. I want to make that clear on this show that we're both Gentiles. What has given you, and, and I know your position concerning the Jews, what has given you your strong conviction here? Because I see it too. It's purely they just hate the Jews. I mean, I don't even call it anti-Semitism. It's hate. That almost is too nice of a word. There's almost this pure hatred, and I see it in geopolitics, this treatment of the Jews like they're less than human. And they're not even given the same rights in governing the, their own country. Uh, and you begin to see it. And I can just go on on that topic alone, but it's pure hatred. And it's a hatred that's inexplainable and against no other people but the Jews. I'm sorry, I just had to to voice that. But I think anti-Semitism is almost too nice a word. It's hatred, pure, unadulterated hatred, treating another human being like they're less than human. That's how the Jews are treated. That's my perspective from what I'm seeing throughout the international political realm. It, it's, it's almost everywhere. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> No, uh, thank you. Uh, I'll answer you with a two-part answer. First of all, my own experience. You asked about uh, you asked about uh, me being a Gentile. Yes, I am. And uh, for me, I suppose that my exposure began uh, back in the early '80s uh, when I made my first trip to the Middle East. As a matter of fact, it was. Uh, it was, uh, we think it was October of 1981. Uh, I remember that day because I was in Cairo on the day that Anwar Sadat was assassinated. And I realized then that I was witnessing, I was witnessing an important and watershed event in the Middle East. That was my first trip to to the Middle East. I spent time in Israel and I have made numerous trips there for the past two decades. I, I was impacted by the nation of Israel. Uh, you cannot visit the land and stand on Masada and visit Jerusalem and go to Yad Vashem without being impacted. And I, I would bet people who just indiscriminately react and choose a side, which the internet and social media allows uh, people to do in this day and age. But I 
they heard, urge me before they judge Israel to visit the place. Go there. Learn for yourself. And also, study a little bit about history. Yes, there are Arabs in the land. Yes, there are Arabs that have been there, give or take, in larger or lesser numbers for the last 1,200 years. But yes, there are Jews, give or take, number, that have lived there unceasingly for 4,000 years. So if you're going to go back, go all the way back. Al Jazeera, which we know espouses terrorism and has journalists that were part of the October 7th, but they have, as you know, I'm an evangelical, and they've launched a major attack against evangelicals because we're a strong supporter of Israel, and they put out all kinds of misinformation. One of the pieces that they miss, which is exactly what you're covering right now, is the historical record. And one of the things that the evangelicals look at is the historical record. And you have not only what was stated by God to Abraham, but you have this record of a kingdom period with David and Solomon in this whole period of kings from the northern and southern kingdom to the Babylonian captivity. You don't have that with the Palestinians. You don't have a historical record, and a lot discount the Bible as a historical record. I mean, you're part of archaeological finds in Israel, aren't you? Concerning the historical record? Yes, the organization that I'm a part of uh, participates in a wide range of activities and involvement in Israel, and a part of that is, uh, yes, some archaeological excavations that uh, the president of our organization has helped to uh, co-sponsor with the local uh, university here uh, in the States and the in Israeli Antiquity Authority. So yes, I have had exposure to that part, and I might add that those artifacts that are being dug up in Israel are Jewish. There's more discoveries that back up the historical account and I know that some discount the scriptures as fiction can do a whole piece just on that. But part of it, as you said, is this whole historical record. There's discoveries all of the time. I was shocked when there was even a discovery of Agav Bashan, the city and, and these different things in the, the Middle East region that just back up the biblical historical narrative, that that's also your focus, is the history. Well, as I said, Eric, those, those artifacts that are being uncovered uh, today are, are Jewish or Roman artifacts. I've yet to go to the land and visit a Palestinian museum. And these are the facts that either people do not know or ignore. Uh, one point that you made earlier about the fact that Christians are being persecuted by, uh, by radical groups uh, is true. But that gets back and, and goes to a, an entirely different subject, and that's the subject of the end game uh, for the Middle East. Uh, these are people if they leave, they're going to leave in state a caliphate. And the Christians and democracy and Jews are not in their picture. And one of the things recently that caught my eye was mentioning the Christians as the president and CEO of the National Religious Broadcasters uh, announced that they endorsed the resolution that are opposing the time West Bank and adopting Judea and Samaria in the future. Uh, the West Bank is a geographical term given to it by Jordan when they controlled that area from 1948 to 1967. And West Bank was merely a geographical term they uh, referred to as the part of the land across the Jordan. But if 
you read the Bible, if you read earlier documents, it was never called West Bank. West Bank, as I say, is a geographical term. It was called, it did have a name. That name is Judea and Samaria. So they determined in all of their publicity and all of their interviews that going forward, they will apply the correct, the correct, the right, and the original term, Judea and Samaria. So those are the little things that, that help make a difference because people are so accustomed to using the term Palestine, uh, Palestine, Palestinians or Palestine, Greek Palestine. And those who know the history know that that's a term given to it by the Romans to eradicate the identity and the Jews from the land in 135 AD. And that has not or never has been the identity of the land. And, but they still think that when Israel had a right and a legitimate right to come back to the original land which they had lived on for 4,000 years, that in the eyes of the propaganda and the radical organization, their end game is of course to eradicate the Jews. It's not compromise. It's not two-state solution. And again, how is it that so many governments around the world are saying that this is the solution? And I, I actually did a show. I don't even like the word solution. I, that bothers me because it, it's a throwback to the final solution. And I did a piece on why when it comes to the Jewish people, there's always a solution. Ralph, I, Ralph the, the level of hatred that just really surfaces over time as you are just, just following just different pieces is just unbelievable. Again, I don't even like that word because it's a throwback to something that's another horrific um, time. But I think the thing that's concerning is the fact that you have this most brutal, brutal attack, so brutal on October the 7th to a people. And it's almost as if, you know, it's swept under a rug you have these Hamas leaders walking 10 feet tall, looking into the camera, and yet they've orchestrated this level of savagery and brutality. And what's getting out there is not those stories. What's getting out there is propaganda of occupation, apartheid, aid not getting into Gaza, and that Israel is committing acts of genocide, which is almost ridiculous that that would even be thrown at Israel as committing genocide. Well, Eric, first of all, on the two-state solution, there have been nine peace proposals rejected by the Palestinians beginning in 1947. And I, if people would, would want to know more about that, I'll use the Yogi Berraism, a famous uh, baseball player that, that was full of puns. He can look it up. But nine times, a two-state solution has been on the table. And if we look back and reflect on the history, there have been 16 conflicts considered as wars by the Israeli Minister of Defense. 16 conflicts that have been given names. In this time, times Israel has been offered, Israel has offered and made compromises. Nine times. They've been met by constant, constant rejection of all peace initiatives. But you have to wonder about the governments or their advisors. There was a term called feel-good legislation, and you have feel-good legislation. It makes everybody feel good, but it's not anything that's really going to solve a problem. And that seems to be the case here. It's also interesting, Ralph, that none of the Arab nations want to take in any of the Palestinians. I just saw a piece today. Their focus and the, the push is on Israel 
to not occupy. And the occupation, it's also interesting that they are not taking in any refugees and they don't want to take in any of the Palestinians. But what do you think, Ralph, is a solution here? What do you think is a, a good way to solve this issue? Well, Eric, if I had the answer for that, uh, I could clear up a lot of ills. I, I don't have the answer for it. Uh, Israel certainly was a... Oh, so uh, hold on, the dog decided to bark. My little dog's Bobo, and Bobo is... Okay, we've got to just give Bobo a second. We're discussing a two-state solution. And the fact that that's been on the table so many times and rejected... Uh, by the Arabs, by the Palestinians, uh, is it, it, really a shame. Uh, Israel deserves a legitimate partner for peace. The world should recognize that. They should be reaching out their hands and saying, okay, let's negotiate. Okay, so you were saying about the two state. Well, what about uh, making sure that? those who are coming to the table recognize Israel's right to exist or possibly a type of a federation. I mean, there's other alternatives here. If the Palestinians want to have their own identity within the state, like the Indians here in the United States, they have special rights and they identify as Indians. I mean, there's different ways that it could be approached and still be the state of Israel and the Palestinians being a state within the state. But the problem is, that's not even the issue. The issue is, they don't recognize Israel, and they want their own land. And this is unprecedented in history. This would apply to Israel when it's never applied to any other country when there's been a change. When the United States came in, did we divide the United States with the Indians? And I just did a piece on Cyprus, the European Union, basically saying that there should be unification. You have a similar issue. And the EU says no two-state with Cyprus, but says definitely a two-state with Israel. Yes, well, it's, it's certainly a, it's a double standard, and uh, it, it's been that way for a long, long time. But the fact remains, Erica, that Israel is faced with a hostile Arab population that is yet to come to terms with Israel's existence and basically actively seeks to destroy the Jewish state. That's not a legitimate partner for peace. And of course, uh, yes, it's been said, it's been proposed that perhaps that the PLO uh, should uh, after Hamas's demise, if that happens, that the PLO should step back into Gaza, and that to seek a two-state solution with a reformed PLO. I'm not sure what that means. I'm not sure what that would look like. Because the record state and surveys show that over 75% of the people, not only in Gaza, but in the West Bank, prefer Hamas and justify Hamas's action. To me, that's not a legitimate partner for peace. Solution possibly is Israel punching up to its weight. Israel is, last I knew, eighth in the world. I know in Europe, my goodness, it's an associate state. It's in over 5,000 Horizon programs. It's got the gas pipeline that'll give 10% of gas to Europe. With the United States, we have a lot of different agreements with Israel as well. So if you take that nation and you now cut it in half, so to speak, you're going to upset its economy and you're going to upset its place in the world, but you're also going to upset the geoeconomic balance that these major countries have with Israel. So why they're putting forth this two-state solution when they've, when Israel is at a strong place, but also I think Israel needs to punch up to its weight. This is where we're at in the world. This is what we're offering, and you need to drop this policy. That's 
my opinion, Israel needs to punch up to its weight. I don't know that Israel can, though, because of so much hatred. And if it did, hey, it's punching up to its weight right now in Gaza. What do you think of that, Ralph? Israel punching up to its weight and basically saying to the nations, look, we offer you this. We have this with you. I, I even read where the European Union wanted to sanction Israel. They can't because then they would shoot themselves in the foot having something to do with their with trade balances and things. So they can't sanction even if they wanted to. At this point, maybe Israel just needs to punch up to its weight. Or, or am I being too optimistic here? Well, I think over the course of events here, because that's going to work itself out, Israel has proven record uh, for 75 or 80 years of punching up to its weight, of doing what it has to do. Unfortunately, at uh, this time, uh, it's, it's not the best of circumstances in Israel with the political crisis of what was going on before the October 7th massacre and the fact that it, it, uh, it, it's not on the same page uh, in terms of its um, uh, politics right now. So you don't have a unified uh, sense of thought in Israel, but I, I, I have faith, and many have faith, that they will do what they must do. Uh, understand, uh, it, it was said years ago uh, by one of the Prime, Minister, Prime Ministers of Israel in, in facing one of our U.S. Presidents who was questioning such things, and they said, Mr. President, to you it's foreign policy, to us it's survival. And that puts a different perspective on it. So I, I'm, I'm convinced uh, in the end uh, we're going to see Israel do what Israel must do for its survival. Uh, an earlier point that I didn't answer for you, that you asked for why the surrounding Arab nations could not step up and take, uh, except some of the refugees. The, the one thing to consider there that uh, was between 1948 and 1967, Egypt ruled Gaza. And Jordan ruled what they refer to as the West Bank. So for 19 or 20 years, the issue of Palestinian statehood was never on the table. And Egypt built high walls around the border between Egypt and Gaza. But frankly, they didn't want an immigration. Uh, the PLO tried to overthrow uh, the King of Jordan, tried to assassinate King Hussein, tried to take over the state, and thousands were killed in a bloody war known as Black September. The PLO left then and went to Lebanon, tore the country up, formed a state within a state to Israel and Baby and evicted them. They moved to Tunis, and they continued to hit at Israel from surrounding nations uh, such as Lebanon and Syria, and they are supported and backed by uh, Iran. Uh, these are Iran's proxies, and I don't know the answer to that. It's a most difficult situation, but I can say this. I don't think we have any doubt if, if missiles were fired and borders were breached by Mexico that came into Texas towns and did what Hamas did from Gaza, we would have had any problem getting back and getting back with the kind of force that we see Israel taking. We would not have stand, stood for it, we wouldn't stand for it, and I don't believe that Israel will. And I believe in the end, uh, it's just the most, most difficult situation. It's one of the hardest wars any, anyone has ever fought. So we'll, we'll have to see what the outcome is.
I listened to Christine Lagarde, and she was talking about the strength of the EU economy and how Europe can punch up to its weight. And I was thinking of Israel. Israel has a lot of strength in world affairs because it is the democracy in the region and because it contributes so much to other nations in so many different areas through its startups, through its technology, through different programs it's it's involved in. It's almost like when you're looking at a Palestinian state or Israel, you're, it's like almost two worlds apart, and then you're wanting to take this strong nation and weaken it, which is just going to upset balances. So I would like to see Israel really recognize how, what it is contributing to the European Union, what it's contributing to the United States, and basically saying, drop this two-state because it's going to be detrimental to our nation, and that'd be the end of it. In the words of one of our uh, famous philosophers and, and doctors, uh, Dr. Phil, he says, well, how's that working out for you? Well, it's not working out so well. Um, contributes so much, but I, I would bet the European Union and the nations of the world would see what Israel contributes, and that it's a shining light of democracy in a darkened area. Uh, in the Middle East that is, that is known on the war, uh, that, that it, it has nations that are applying 7th century uh, understanding and beliefs in a 21st century world. That's dangerous. It's dangerous for those kinds of nations to gain nuclear capability because their goals are different. They're a different society and they would, would want to see a different ending that uh, within democratic societies uh, really and better than these. Well, what do you think is the reason with what Israel offers? And you're right, the, the shining democracy and the threats. Why then, let's say Joseph Burrell, why is he catering to the two-state solution and the Arab nations is there something he's hoping that the European Union is going to gain out of that? Because there's no comparison to what the EU has with Israel. And actually, the EU pumps more aid into Palestine than any other, any other, I don't want to say, um, any other empire. And, uh, and that would continue. In other words, it would just be funding a banana republic. But so I think that boggles my mind, is when you see these leaders taking this position, or what do they hope they're going to be gaining from it? Because it doesn't make geopolitical sense. Well, uh, there's a factor there that we, we should consider, is that not everything that is spoken for public consumption uh, is the reality of what they're saying to themselves behind closed doors. Uh, there, it, it, for instance, let's take, let's take Jordan as an example. We'll come back to the European Union, but let's take Jordan as an example. Uh, King Hussein uh, has a treaty, uh, Jordan has a treaty with Israel. Israel has come to Jordan's defense on multiple occasions when Syria sent tanks into northern uh, Jordan, Israel jet fighters drove them off. Jordan knows it, it needs Israel for its own security. That Iran and other countries has designs on Jordan. They would, they would love to have a border uh, again uh, with Israel to be able to attack them. Jordan's mere existence depends on uh, Israel, Israel's security. But if you hear what is announced in the press in Jordan, uh, it, it's, it, it's to appease the Arab street. Uh, over half of Jordan is Palestinian. 
And you say one thing for public consumption because you don't want to ed uh, agitate the, the masses. You don't want to, you don't want uh, demonstrations. You don't want them to rise up and overthrow your government. So you, you poke the party line and, and behind the scenes and together in, in their own form of, of government, they're probably rooting hard for Israel to finish the job on Hamas. So my point being that when you consider the European Union, you consider the United States interest, uh, there, there's a certain amount of appeasement for the street. Uh, these are countries with, uh, with significant Arab populations. Uh, you also have, have those, the demonstrations in the street of, streets of Europe and in America. Uh, you must you must appear even-handed. You must appear concerned, and you must appear seeking a solution that would satisfy both parties. So I I, I do take some of what is stated in, in the public discourse of the grain of salt and say what do they really want? Uh, the fact that Saudi Arabia today is seeking some kind of accord with Israel speaks to the greater picture of the land being a, a tremendous threat to Saudi Arabia. Right before the attack, Netanyahu had presented his plan for the Middle East and the Abraham Accords and going even further with Saudi Arabia and then the war. Yes, the, the, war, the war moderate countries recognize the fact that Israel is a stable nation that Israel's example to the Middle East of what it could do and what it could be uh, it is a shining light. They need Israel's stability. They need Israel's, uh, they, they need Israel's attitude of, uh, of, of peace with their neighbors to, to be a factor. So the, the radical element in the Middle East is a threat to the alignment machines in the Middle East. And that's why you see Morocco, uh, you, you see the UAE, you see the Saudi Arabia, uh, recognizing that and recognizing that Israel is a significant player to the stability of the Middle East and fearing the radicals and fearing the, the aligning its, its radical proxies uh, even more. So you really do have to pick through the facts of what is stated publicly and what goes on behind the scenes and the negotiations that goes on behind the scenes. I don't know that they have a better way of presenting that now than to offer a two-state solution because the, the something has to be done with the Palestinian people. That has to be resolved. You can't ignore a couple million people. But uh, you remember, uh, Egypt wouldn't take them in. Jordan wouldn't take them in. And if they're going to remain on the land, uh, instead of, I suppose there could be a one-state solution with citizenship for all. There are Arab citizens in Israel today. There are Arabs that serve in the Knesset. There are Arabs in the, in the uh, Israeli military. There's a land for all. Yes, that's what I see as a one state can be almost like a virtual state and they can live anywhere in Israel, but they identify as being the Palestinian and maybe there's more money thrown for them to so that they can really integrate into Israel society. That's another thing. Israel is so strong in so many areas. It would make sense for the Palestinians to want to be part of that state, maybe having their own state within the state, like in a federation, and then they would benefit and then they can have opt-outs. I know one of the issues is certain Islamic beliefs. In EU law, there's what are called opt-outs, and certain nations opt out of certain legislation. So you would have opt-outs, and they wouldn't then be subject to maybe those particular laws in Israel. There's different ways that this can be done to integrate them into Israel. But as you said, they want their own state because they don't recognize the state of Israel. Today, Israel has, is, is a, 
multicultural society. Uh, Israel not only has Jews, Israel has Arab citizens. Israel has Druze citizens. Israel has Baha'i citizens. Israel, there are Christians in Israel living there. Uh, much like America, we, we're a nation of immigrants. Israel has many peoples, and, and if, if they want to become a part of the nation, if they, if they want to become citizens, they can apply for citizenship, and that can work. America has proven it can work. And we give special status to the Indians in the United States. The Palestinians can have a special status, just like the Indians, but for different reasoning. Yes, but the key there is representation, and the fair shake, and the equal rights. If the peoples have that, uh, generally, that's, that's all they ask for. But in this case, you have two peoples fighting over the same land, and neither uh, thus far has budged. And I, if, if not one state for all, the citizenship for all, and democracy for all, then, then the fallback is to try to work out some workable solution when there are two states. But as I said before, that that's not working well. Right. Or a state within a federation. There's different ways to slice the apple. <laughs> There's different ways it can work. There, there are many, there are many good ideas put on the table. Many good ideas put on the table. But in the end, they have they've been largely and roundly rejected uh, by the Palestinian representation. And also, you have again the the hatred of the Jews. I'm not going to even call it anti-Semitism. I personally think that Joseph Burrell, and I've said it on my show, he hates the Jews, clearly hates the Jews. He is a modern Haman. That's his policy. It's so clear when you listen to him. And he's actually shooting Europe in the foot. He, By the way, he didn't even want to recognize the Abraham Accords. He doesn't even recognize those because he put forward his, uh, well, the, the failed Barcelona conference, and they revamped that, and they've got something for the Mediterranean. I don't even know what they're doing, but he's trying to put forward their agenda. But he's, what he's really putting forward is the two-state solution above everything. It just becomes clear that Burrell doesn't like the Jews. I'm sorry, i got to say it as, it as I see it, and I say it all the time about Burrell. He is a modern Haman in the book of Esther. Well, you're, you're certainly much closer to that situation uh, covering the EU as you do uh, than I am. And, uh, but I, I have to agree, based on what we've seen, I have to agree with the way you've described uh, Mr. Burrell. But uh, as far as the two state solution, Erica, that's uh, in the final analysis, you have to have two parties that want it to work. In the end, you have to have two parties that want it to work. And we do not have that in the Middle East today. I, I don't know the solution to that. It's, it's, it's an impossible situation uh, at the moment. But I, I have to agree that in the end, uh, this thing has to has to reach some sort of viable conclusion uh, where the children of Abraham, where the cousins uh, can meet each other at the same table. And that's what's tragic is the relation there and the hatred among those that are actually related. Yes, I had, uh, and you would recognize the name, I've been on the program before, but I had a, uh, a good friend of the name of David Horowitz. Uh, that I, I wrote a biography about David Stark. He was the dean of, uh, of the press corps at the United Nations, and he, he was there from the inception of the UN until uh, he, until he died uh, in 2002. And he, he saw over a half century of the unfolding events of the United Nations. And David once said to me something that stuck, and it, it would be so far fetched to, to think that possible in our day. But David said, well, he said, uh, God wrote the plan, he drew the boundaries for the land, 
and gave an inheritance to Jacob, and gave an inheritance to Esau. He drew up boundaries, and he said he would bless both peoples. And those their boundaries are, 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 are there. They are there today. And he, he said, this will be an endless attempt until the original deed to that land has been recognized, acknowledged, and returns to the boundaries of what God grew up. Yeah. Wow. Well said. But he said, it will never work until the original plan is put on the table. And thus far, he's been right. Wow. That was very well said, Ralph. Well, this has been an incredible discussion. I want to thank you for coming on today. But uh, again, I want to thank you for having me on as a guest. I hope we can do it again someday. And uh, hopefully we will, uh, our, our prayers and thoughts will be with uh, all the peoples uh, in, in Israel, in Palestine, in that entire area, that this will come to an orderly uh, resolution. Oh, absolutely. Well, that was informative. And I'm so glad that I've had Ralph on the show again. And this is Ralph's second time appearing on The Twist. This is his second visit. And of course, I'm going to have him back again. And you're going to want to be sure to check out his book. It's in our Amazon store. The link is below. And if you don't subscribe to The Twist, hit that button. And we'll see you next time. Go down. Go down.